Hi, and welcome viewers to the series Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. This episode is entitled The District Committed to Carbon Neutrality. My name is Sachi Housen, class of 2021.5 at Middlebury College, and I would like to introduce this episode's guest speaker. I'm joined today by Alex Fisher, class of 2010, an energy policy analyst at the District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment. Welcome and thanks for joining us today, Alex. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, of course. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so Alex, this series explores a number of different professional areas involved in the green economy. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your organization, the DC Department of Energy and Environment and how it fits into this new green economy. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Thanks, Safji. So the my so I work for um, what's effectively the state energy office for the District of Columbia. And like I know that the that DC doesn't have full statehood yet, but um, it really functions like the state's energy office. And you know, we're charged kind of with meeting the state's climate um, commitments, which is to get to 100% renewable electricity by 2032 and to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Oh, wow. That's really ambitious, that's really awesome. Um, I wonder if you could tell us kind of like what exactly your organization does. So like, is it working directly with the city government? Like how does it sort of fit into um, making those decisions? Yeah, so, you know, we're a part of the of the city government um, under under the mayor's office. And um, it's, it's, um, there's like a lot of different pieces. So it's all, it's like an environmental and energy agency, but on the energy side, and like, kind of the work that, that maybe that I do specifically is, you know, in order to get to all of these ambitious climate targets that have been set and now are in legislation within the, within DC, um, we we have to kind of reimagine a few things. And you know, part of that is on sort of the energy system delivery. So one thing that I kind of uh, focus on is on topics like microgrids, um, resilient power, and thinking about the modernization of the energy delivery system. And then, you know, part of that work also includes using GIS. Uh, thank you and shout out to Professor Bill Hegman, by the way, for teaching GIS really well. Um, but kind of using using mapping skills to, to look at the city and to kind of map out where energy use is highest at different times and thinking about that. Um, what other organizations do you, uh, does the department directly work with? Um, and so I think this is probably pretty typical with like state energy offices more more broadly, but you know, we'll, we'll interface with a lot of other district agencies. So there's, you know, um, there's the housing authority. So like our agency kind of handles a lot on the energy side that includes heating, assist, heating and energy assistance for low income families. Um, we have a program called Solar for All that uh, provides uh, no cost solar to income qualified families in the district. Um, we deal with the, you know, the housing authority. I interface a lot with the public service commission. So most states will have a public utilities or public service commission that regulates um, the state's different utilities. Um, and so I, I get to sit on working groups there dealing with different issues. What do you think are some of like the main challenges that the Department of Energy and Environment faces and like how this kind of like changing um, environmental field and like looking towards the future, like how that might affect what you guys do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, um, let's see, how do I put this? I mean, I think this is kind of, really a lot of states are really dealing with a lot of the same issues and it's it's kind of like when we're looking at you know how to meet our our climate obligations it's about how do we do that equitably um and then and then also like how do, we're changing kind of the energy system right so there's a lot to think about like what are all the moving pieces um how do you get from you know if you're thinking about energy system modernization typically everything's been quite centralized um you have energy flowing and data flowing in one direction. 
with kind of the change in, and this like process of modernization, you also have now like customer resources, like things like solar and battery on your house, or if you're in an efficient home, you could even be like a net positive. You could be producing more more energy than you consume um, with like all the strides that that they've made in in kind of building efficiency at the same time. And so thinking about how um, there's this like decentralization happening of energy consumption and how how to make sure that um, you know like people and businesses can actually provide grid services that were pre previously only in the realm of utilities. And how do we, that's a, that's a huge change. And this is something that like state energy office and public utility commissions across the US are you know, having to kind of grapple with. Um, and how does that new paradigm happen? And how does it happen in a way that um, empowers um, an equitable transition where we make sure that people who've been previously left behind actually get to, um, get to share in these gains and benefits. Yeah, that's yeah. really that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really great. I feel like it's really relevant to like what's going on right now. Um, and so I'm wondering like your role specifically as an energy policy analyst, like wondering if you could kind of walk us through your work with what exactly do you do and what are your main responsibilities? Yeah, well, let's see. Um, <laughs> it's really changed. It, it's one thing that's kind of, kind of like great about having a role in as like a public servant or in local or state government is that I think things are kind of like, especially with climate policy right now, there's like a lot happening on day to day. And so it could change. Um, there's always uh, plenty of meetings in government. That's fun. Um, but also, you know, I think my day to day is fairly split between thinking about regulatory issues. Um, things like solar interconnection, grid modernization, and then on the other side, kind of parsing through energy data and thinking about kind of like long-term planning towards our towards our priorities. I, I don't know, what? I guess it's great like day-to-day, -day, but that's just sort of, it, it can really be, there's a lot of things that fall within that. So. Yeah, what do you think is your favorite thing about the work that you do? Um, I would say I, I really value the the like the privilege of working it you know for a local government. I think that that is something I had sort of wished I knew this was a career path like a, a lot sooner than I than I did. Um, I think it just really is it it's so great to just align your work with like what people want and need. Um, and I think that sometimes like that I wasn't really able to find that in like either the private sector or the nonprofit sector. Um, so I really feel like I'm like working on behalf of where I live, which is, which is really cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, um, and I guess on the flip side, like what do you think is the most challenging about your role in particular? You know, I think it, I think what's, what can be, what can be challenging is that, you know, especially in where we're, there's a lot to do. Um, it, it's funny because energy is actually kind of the easy one on climate change because we already know what all the technical solutions are. Um, <laughs> whereas it's some of the harder stuff is, is gonna be things like cement, steel, like how are we gonna decarbonize those industries? That's, that stuff is hard and still there's a lot of R&D going on, at least with energy, like we know what we have to do. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an easy lift. I think it's, you know, the, like reimagining the way we use energy is not, an, is not an easy task. And it's like, it requires thinking about, for example, in cities, buildings are kind of the, the like the largest footprint for us, about two thirds and then transportation is about a third. And uh, other cities look fairly similar to this. And so you have to think about like, you can do a lot with building codes to get you your new buildings to be, you know, net zero or super energy efficient. But then you have this existing building stock that's like, how are we going to retrofit these um, to bring down, you know, to bring down energy use? And I think, I don't know if this is specifically like the challenge for for me personally, but this is more of a challenge I think in in general, just trying to work in this space um, is that you know there's there's always 
like when we follow the deep decarbonization pathway principles, it's always the first thing we need to do is reduce energy consumption. And that makes the rest of all the fuel switching we have to do so much easier and so much more cost effective. Um, but it's hard, I think, generally, like to, you know, I think energy efficiency is in some ways that it, it can be very difficult because it means that we have to like transition an entire building stock into something more efficient. And that that's a heavy lift. That's that requires all types of public investment. I know the you know the Biden administration is looking at doing a lot of building retrofits, and that's kind of like federal policy, but um that's that's something that's that's hard. And I think it's also like just getting all the stakeholders in the room to kind of align on on how to move this stuff forward. Um, that's always, I mean, it's fun, but it's also, that can be, that can be challenging too. Mm -hmm. um, like within your role in like looking at policy and like being involved in um, more local government, like how do you see that changing in the future? Like with new administrations, how does that impact your work? Yeah, that definitely does, you know, impact our work. Part of it is to, you know, the federal government is in DC. And so decisions they make about federal buildings, like impact our overall footprint, certainly. But in terms of, you know, more broadly, you look at, you know, there's potentially clean energy legislation coming. Um, the FERC is kind of moving in a new direction. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is already kind of, there. there's all these kind of arcane rules that, that impact shouldn't say our team. There's all these rules that impact, you know, the the regional transmission organizations and how like electricity is bought and sold at the wholesale market level. Um, and the FERC oversees that. And so that has kind of major ramifications when you're just kind of working at the city level, you don't have the ability to, Im to impact decisions on that scale. Um, so I think, you know, I've only, I, you know, I had only really been in this role um, under the Trump administration. And so there wasn't a whole lot kind of coming from uh, from there. And now I think there's definitely, you know, it looks like there will be a lot more support from the federal government, but we'll, we'll have to see what that looks like. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Um, when you think about kind of like how the, the green economy is shifting and transforming, where do you think you'll you see like the greatest growth prospects in the field, like whether that be um, doing similar roles you were before you're talking about trying to figure out like how do we decarbonize um, like cement like that kind of stuff. Like where do you think is more growth is happening? Oh gosh, um, that one, yeah, I don't know how qualified I am to answer that, but I think, you know, some, I think one thing that I definitely see coming, um, and this is something that I'm very interested in as well, is sort of resilience through combined like energy efficiency and microgrid technology. So if that's a single building, you're thinking about solar and battery backup where you can island if the grid goes down and at least provide kind of backup power to certain essential needs you have within your home or, or, or building. Um, I think, given what just happened in Texas um, with the, the really serious outages, what's been going on in California with the wildfires, you look at a state like California is really moving on, on microgrid installation. I wonder if we'll see more of that. Um, there's a lot of states that are really taking that seriously. Um, so I, I see that as kind of one place coming. I know the cost of battery storage has declined pretty rapidly in recent years. And I believe the installation, the rate of installation of, of battery capacity has been increasing a lot as well. Um, you know, some states incentivize it. California has a storage mandate um, by 2050. So there's certain, you know, th there's definitely some movement in the storage space more generally. Um, and that can kind of both increase the amount of solar that can come online if you're looking at distributed or other types of distributed renewable generation. And then it also provides that, that backup power uh, without real having to rely on things like diesel generators. So that's a big place um, that, that I always have kind of kept my eye on. Um, beyond that, I, I you know, I'd have to defer to, to other experts, but I, I do think kind of like that, like distributed um, kind of local generation is, is a big space and it already has been. I mean, the solar market has really just been 
kind of on on the up uh, for a long time and despite some setbacks, you know, during COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned like in addition to microgrids and stuff that you were just talking about, you use a lot of mapping and GIS skills that you like learned on campus um, here at Millbury. And I was wondering if you could like expand on that, what aspects from your Middlebury experience, like a coursework or skills, extracurriculars, um, what kind of stuff that you learned on campus, um, like kind of best prepared you for the work that you do now? Yeah, that's a great question. I would have to say, so I did, I was an environmental studies um, major at Middlebury and I did, I minored in French um, and I, ended up using all of that throughout throughout my career later. Um, and, you know, GIS was one part of that, but I was focused on environmental policy. Um, and I did a thesis with Professor Kleiza and I was looking a lot at um, like environmental regulations and um, things that are cross jurisdictional. And so I, you know, I've, I've kind of had a like a winding career, but I sort of landed back where I was originally planning to be um, based on like everything I, I studied in college, so. Um, but that um, kind of leads well into like this next little segment of this interview. I'm really curious to know about your experience from campus to your current career. Like you just mentioned you uh, majored in environmental studies and policy um, and kind of like how like kind of what your story is, like how you got from Middlebury to where you are. Sure. So I graduated in uh, the spring of 2010. Um, that was also, there was a financial crisis at that time as well. Um, those seem to come fairly often these days. I, I uh, remember just kind of being a little bit lost about what I wanted to do. And I ended up taking an English teaching job in Qatar. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I was looking at, you know, going to, should I go to grad school? Should I do a political geography PhD or, or something? And then I, um, I ended up just um, staying in Doha and working on environmental science and for a consulting company uh, for a couple more years. And that was, um, that was fun. I was doing a lot of marine science and uh, scuba diving and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, it was hot. And, uh, and then I came to DC after that. And I did a two year um, master's degree at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Um, and while I was at SAIS, I kind of switched from like the earth science, more the earth sciences into thinking about energy, specifically renewable energy and energy access. Um, and I got really into microgrids and the concept of off-grid microgrids. Um, as sort of a way to leapfrog past the need to expand kind of like your traditional grid infrastructure, which becomes very expensive. Um, and that, that was something I focused on a lot. Then I worked for a nonprofit doing that type of work for a while. And then I worked at an, another consulting firm focusing on renewable energy and energy access and microgrids um, that did a lot of consulting to the uh, to US government agencies like the US Trade and Development Agency and USAID, and then I, that's and then at that point I um, said I wanted to focus on you know more local, and that's when I applied to work in the district government. Um, you mentioned uh, like coming to DC for Johns Hopkins and like getting that uh, master's degree. Was that always something that was part of your plan to go to grad school? Um, were you planning on? coming to DC regardless? Like how did that um, kind of come about? You know, I, wa I wasn't really planning to do either of those things necessarily. Um, it just kind of happened. Like I had, I had a friend who was from Middlebury uh, who was in that program and was like, I think you would really like this, check it out. I think you should apply. And I was like, yeah, that does look, you know, interesting. I am interested in energy and I want to focus on climate. Um, and I, you know, I looked at, I looked at a few syllabuses and all that, and I, and I, and I ended up applying and, and doing that. Um, and that's what, you know, that program specifically is what brought me into DC. And, and that, that program was really international focused. Um, 
and I did do some international work after that. And then I, I started to kind of think about, again, I mean, if you think about like where, <laughs> where in the world is the climate pollution coming from, um, you know, it's coming from countries like the US, especially cities in the US and, and like how to focus on, on, you know, addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, how do like advanced degrees kind of set you apart within the field? Like, do you think it's like really important to get one? Um, like how does that kind of fit into the career path? Yeah, this is, <laughs> that's a really great question. I do not have an easy answer to that. I, I, I would say like in my role now, which I, you know, I'm really happy to have to be doing this work that I'm doing now. And I don't think I could have gotten it without my, my master's degree. Having said that, I mean, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about recommending, you know, graduate programs just because the, the debt is real, I will say. Uh, it is very intense. <laughs> and um, that's not, you know, it's it's hard to say that, that that's, I mean, it, that really is a serious consideration. Um, taking on debt to go to grad school, it is really, it's like beyond, you know, to college, it's, it's tough. And, I also, you know, so I think with, with grad school, it's really, um, it's really important that you kind of like have a thing or some kind of a niche that you're really focused on and that you know you're going to use it for. Um, and like, you know that you need it to get a role. I would, I just am very encouraging of making sure that like all of that is in a row before taking that leap. Um, because otherwise it's, I mean, I, <laughs> I have family members who have like done graduate degrees and then ended up not using them. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that's really good advice for students that are like trying to figure that out now um, that are about to graduate from Middlebury, but kind of on the same thought, like what other pieces of advice um, would you give to students like that are in, the job search might be um, graduating this May or next February? Sure. Um, I think one thing I would have liked to have known probably is that, I mean, so it's easy to get kind of stuck um, in a job that you may like and you may be good at that is undervaluing you. And um, there, you know, I, so like one thing I've done is I probably haven't been in a, any role for more than like one to two years. You know, I've been out of college like 11 years and I just mentioned <laughs> all those changes I made. That's, that's okay. Um, and it's totally okay to like get into something in a year and be, be like, this isn't for me or I'm being overworked and underpaid because the best way to get a promotion um, is especially for like any women I know of any in, from any background, really, the way that that women like kind of get promotions is is by getting a new job. It's really hard to rise up within within a role. I have just seen that like time and time again, and I do kind of wish I had known that when I was first entering the workforce because it it is easy to get kind of stuck. Um, and so I would just encourage, you know, it's okay to walk away from something if it's if it's not serving you. I, again, you know, like it's easy you know, if you go out and look for other jobs, it's really okay to not like, I think there's a lot of pressure that you have to stick somewhere for two years or three years. And I, I would just encourage people not to, not to do that. Yeah, yeah that's really <laughs> great advice. Um, what do you think, like when you're like in these positions to be looking for new jobs, like what skill sets do you think that are are important to hold? I have to say that Things like, um, at least in this in this field, I think having some ability to do, like in addition to knowing policy, having the ability to do like the data analysis, the GIS, even like if you could code, if you could learn to code, I, I, I don't really know how to code, but I know people who do, and it's it can be it can be helpful. Um, so I think kind of developing some of those those hard skills on where you can um, manage data can can really help you. Um, and I guess just a couple more questions, like what types of experiences do you think will like lend themselves to an, kind of like an entry level job within your field? Yeah, I, I would say if something interests you, 
for an entry level position, just go for it. Um, you can, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't determine your entire future it, it, and it doesn't have to. And just to wrap up, do you have any final advice for students that are looking um, into their careers right now? Um, yeah, I would, I would just say, you know, if there's something that you really, <laughs> that you're really interested in, you know, don't be afraid to go for it. Um, don't be intimidated by, you know, sometimes the minimum job requirements are more flexible than they appear. So if something says three to five years and you, <laughs> you know, you're just coming out, don't, don't let that stop you from applying. The worst that you'll get is a no. Um, and, and I know too, like this is a really hard job market right now. And so I'm not gonna pretend that I like have all the answers on how to, how to job hunt in a pandemic. Um, but if there is anything, like if, if there's anything in the field that, that I've worked in or described that is of interest to students, I would be really happy to share contact information and just be a resource if anyone wants to bounce ideas off me. I'm like always happy to hear from, from its students. So, yeah. Yeah, I think mean, that's great. I think it'd be a great resource for students to have. Um, and I just want to say this concludes this episode from the series, Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. Um, in closing, I just want to encourage viewers to tune in to get career perspectives and advice from a number of other professionals in a broad variety of organizations in our other episodes in this series. Um, I want to encourage you all to tune into the other Midvantage series um, that can be accessed through the events and programs tab on CCI website. Um, so thank you again for watching and thanks for being with us today, Alex. It was really great to have this Thank you. you.